eventually we will get into uh, 2 Samuel. If you were to uh, look at some of the most interesting stories in the Bible, it wouldn't be very hard to find a lot of those really in the life of Saul and David. Um, I, I love the life of David. Um, even this afternoon, just kind of reading through some of his history and, and his life, just an absolutely stunning young man. I, no, there's no two ways about it. Another would be Joseph. Just every, it seems like everything he did, he just did it the right way. And um, David's the same exact way. And so as you go through the life of Saul and David, it's kind of interesting because they, they kind of, it's, it's like a sports match between them. Uh, one will gain ground for a while, the other will be on the run, and then the other will come back. And it's this tug of war, it's this back and forth between the two of them. And it really starts when Saul is the king. So Saul's the king over Israel, and, 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 and the, the children of Israel choose him. He's the king there for them. He's the people's king. And while he's the king, God chooses his man, and God's man is a man after his own heart, which is David. And so while Saul is king over Israel, God anoints the next king, and that's David. And he does that privately. So at this, there's just this weird dynamic of somebody who's on the throne, but somebody who God chose. What do you do? I mean, if we were just being honest with that, what do you do with that? I mean, you've got somebody who's in authority, who's in that position that you're supposed to respect, and yet God has chosen somebody else at the same time. So who do you follow? What do you do? It's just, it's a fascinating dynamic. And of course, we know stories like how they're, they're fighting with the Philistines and there's this giant who comes up and, and David comes in and Saul's the king out there and, and Saul has this weird dynamic with David who tries to put his own armor on David. And then there's this backstory of how David's playing the harp to soothe Saul and so just a lot of stuff going on and a lot of interesting stories, really with just these two. And of course, we know the story how David kills Goliath and the people end up loving David more than they love Saul. And, and you know, the song that they sang where Saul has killed his thousands, but David is tens of thousands, tens of thousands. And so just an absolute crazy story. And that's just the beginning. Because then you get into the point where David strikes up this friendship with, with Saul's uh, son Jonathan, and, and it, it, that's a very special friendship there. It's not something that's just, hey, we're buddies. It, it's a really close uh, a relationship between these two. And, and that's even in and of itself is fascinating because we have a man who God has said is going to be the next king, and we have the rightful next king who are now best friends. So who's going to take it? It's just fascinating. It, it really is. So you go through these stories and and uh, right there after David and Goliath saw, and, or Jonathan and David rather, have this conversation, and they actually make a covenant with each other. And they just say, they lay it out there, and they just say, look, you're my best friend. I would die for you. I would do anything for you. Let's just make a point, no matter who becomes the next king, let's just take care of each other. Let's just be there for each other. And they do. They make that pact. They make that covenant. And sure enough, Jonathan keeps his side because his dad is going to kill David. Three times he tries to kill him in the palace, and, and Saul or Jonathan warns David about Saul trying to kill him. So Jonathan says, you got to get out of here. You need to run, take off. And David runs away, and Saul pursues because of his hatred for David. And, and it, oh, it's just, it's crazy. It's so crazy because... David marries Jonathan's sister, who Saul's daughter as well. It's just this jumbled up mess. And there's just stories after stories of how Saul is trying to absolutely destroy David. And David has his opportunities to take his shots, but he doesn't because he just handles himself wisely. He just does the right thing. We're talking about points where Saul goes into a cave and little does he know David is in there with all of his men. And David has the opportunity to kill Saul, and nobody's ever going to know. He even cuts off a piece of Saul's garment. I mean, that close. How do you not know that somebody's right there? Why are you in a cave, in a dark cave by yourself like that? You know, it's just this crazy stuff that's going on. He cuts off a piece of that garment, and sure enough, Saul goes back out. 
David comes out and he says, hey, look, I'm sorry. Saul realizes what was going on. Oh, my goodness. David could have killed Saul right there. Not long after, Saul with his army is sleeping out in the field. David and one of his servants go down and get so close to Saul that he, they steal some of Saul's personal belongings. He's right there. Could have killed him again. And yet David, because that man is in a position of authority, David just says, hey, I'm not going to touch him. I'm not going to touch him. But David, he's tried to kill you countless times. I'm not going to do it because God put him in that position. But, but God anointed you to be the next king. I understand that. And I'm just going to trust God when that time comes. But as of right now, I'm not going to do anything. A couple chapters later, Saul and Jonathan both die in battle. And you would think that finally there's this relief and finally there's this comfort of, oh, finally, like I don't have to look over my shoulder. I don't have to run for my life. I don't, I don't have to, to just be worried at, uh, all the time. But, but it's actually the opposite. And while David's men are, are excited and they're, they're celebrating because now David can finally be the king, David actually says, oh, my, how the mighty of Israel have fallen. And he, he mourns and he grieves not just for his best friend Jonathan who died, but also for the king. And so just this uh, unbelievable young man, this unbelievable person who in spite of how he was treated, he treated Saul the right way. Just fascinating stories. And we could talk about story after story after story about what happened between these two. But again, this is just the beginning of the, the craziness of David's life because now who's going to be the king? Well, you would expect that it would be David and everybody would just be happy with that. But there's a problem. Saul had a son, Ishbosheth, and he wanted to be the king. And so he had every right to be the king. He was the next in line. Jonathan had passed away. He's no longer in the picture. So he's the next in line. He rises up to be the king. David is there and he has his following. And so now there's a divide in the land of Israel. The northern kingdom, they follow Ishbosheth, and the southern kingdom, which is Judah, they follow David. And so now there's this split in this huge country uh, over who's going to be their king. And Abner is the, the general for Ishbosheth, and then you've got Joab, who's the general for David, and now there's just fighting that's going on. And so now the north is fighting the south, and, and they're going back and forth, and, and Abner and Joab hate each other, and they're trying to fight, and then David and Ishbosheth have their odds. It's just, it's crazy, all the stuff that goes on. And sure enough, Joab murders Abner. And at that point, chaos breaks loose. It, it's every man for himself. When Joab murdered Abner, Abner's now gone. The general for the army of the north is gone. And then Ishbosheth, he dies. They cut off his head and they bring it to David. So now David is standing there and he's really the only guy left. His people move in to kind of take over. And now David is kind of just accepted as the rightful king over Israel. Pretty crazy how all of the stuff that happened, and we're really flying through the book of 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Samuel, but, but here we are where now David is in control over really all of the land of Israel, and, and, and this isn't too crazy for back in that time period because there were overthrows and there were coups and different things that had happened, and what would naturally happen is if a new king rose into power, he would go in and he would wipe out the entire family of the old king. And that was just to make sure that down the road, somebody couldn't say, actually, that's my throne. And, and they try to rise and, and they try to bring a rebellion and, and try to overthrow the new king that came in. And so this is not an uncommon practice. And so uh, Saul's family, they take off. In 2 Samuel chapter 4, they are leaving the city as quickly as they can. They're, they're getting up. They're packing up as much as they can. They're running. They, they, they get out of town as, as fast as humanly possible because it might not be David who gives the order to kill all of Saul's people. But what's happening is David's men are just going in and they're just doing what they feel needs to be done. So they need to get out. 
And so Saul's family is just packing up and, and they're on their way out. And the Bible talks about it in 1 Samuel chapter 4 that there's this little five-year-old boy who's being carried out and he's dropped and he falls a great distance and he, and he messes up both of his legs and he can't walk any longer. So now there's this little crippled boy out of the house of Saul who, who's just going to have to live this way for the rest of his life. And, and, and he has no choice. He has no say. And you're just looking at this story and you're thinking, how heartbreaking. An innocent little kid who's just being carried away has no idea what's going on and the craziness around him. And he's being carried away and he's dropped and he breaks his legs and messes up his legs to where now he's going to be a cripple for the rest of his life. And, and now we have the family of Saul on the run and hiding. And we have David who's the king over the united group of Israel here, all right? Not the United States of America, the, this united Israel again. And now we see that David begins to do what David does. He's a man after God's own heart. And it's not perfect by any stretch, but David does some things right. He makes Jerusalem the capital, which is what God wanted. And so he makes Jerusalem the capital, and he goes and he gets the Ark of the Covenant, and he brings the Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem. And there's this excitement that happens, and, and even though Uzzah died trying to stabilize the cart uh, because it was being carried the wrong way, even though there was this really low of lows in David's life at that point, uh, what we see is David fixes that problem, he corrects that problem, he brings the Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem, and now there's this great celebration, and, and there's food for everybody, and God's blessing, and, and, and God is really clearly there, and David's just excited, he's dancing before the Lord, and there's this feeling in the air, and, and everything that could be going right is going right, and sure enough, things are going the way that, that David would want them to go. He's excited, and he explains this, it, it's my desire to build God a house. I want to build a temple for God, and that moves God. It moves God in a great way, and that's what I want to look at here this morning for just a couple of uh, minutes before we move on. But if you have your Bible, turn to 2 Samuel chapter 7. I want to show you the response of God from what David says about the temple. It's fascinating. It's fascinating. David, David says, I want to build this house for the Lord, and he wants it to be special. He wants it to be a place for God to meet with his people. And up until this point, God has been intense. God has been moved around. His house has been moved around in the tabernacle format. And so David desires to build this house. Look at verse 8. He says, Now therefore, so shall thou say unto my servant David. This is God's response to David for David's desire to build a house for God. Okay? So God is speaking in, in, to his servant David. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep coat. From the following the sheep to be a ruler over my people Israel. And I was with thee whithersoever thou wentest. And have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight. And have made thee a great name like unto the name of great men that are in the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them. That they may dwell in the place of their own and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. God is moved by David's uh, desire to live for him and to serve him as the king of his people. And because David said, I'm going to give God a house, God now responds to David and says, because you've done that for me, I'm now making a covenant with you. Okay? So now God is making a covenant with David and he's saying this, I'm going to bless the people of Israel. I'm going to give them a permanent home. I'm going to give them peace. I'm going to give them a place that they can call their own. And I'm not going to let the wicked afflict them anymore like they have in the past. Verse 11. And, and since the time that I commanded judges to be over uh, my people Israel and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee in house. And when the days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall 
uh, proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. So God says to David this, not only am I going to do this for the children of Israel, but I'm going to establish your family and your kingdom, and, and I'll make your house to live here forever. And so a fascinating promise from God to David. And he says, David, when you're old and you pass away, your sons will be here and your sons will be able to continue to have their line. Verse 13, he shall build an house for, thy, for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he shall be my son. If he committed iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men, but my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee, and thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever according to all the words that... Um, and according to the vision, so Nathan did speak unto David. So God's response to David is this. I'm not only going to give Israel a place that they can call their own, that they can, can set up to be theirs. I'm also going to establish your kingdom. And as long as they follow after me and they do what I want them to do, I'm going to be there for them. And can you imagine as David is hearing this from God... Uh, the thoughts that are going through his mind, all he's thinking is this, all I wanted to do is just serve you. All I wanted to do is just do good for you because you have already done so good to me. And now God is making another promise to David and he's telling David, your kingdom will be established forever and it will be here and nobody's going to be able to do anything about it. That is an incredible promise from God to David. Can you imagine the feelings that are coming through David's mind and through his heart? Thankfully, we don't have to imagine them. He tells us right here. Verse 18. And when the King David had sat before the Lord, he said what only he could say. Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that thou hast brought me hitherto? I don't deserve this. How could you be so good to me? How could you possibly do such great things for me when I'm just a sinful man? When I don't do right? He, he's probably thinking to himself, I did cut off part of Saul's garment and I shouldn't have touched him. I have done things that are wrong. I did cost Uzzah his life while we were moving the cart the wrong way and we weren't moving the ark of God the wrong way and, and we weren't doing it the way that you had told us to do it. And that is my fault. I'm not worthy of these promises that you've made to me and to my family. And, and so God is just dumping these blessings on David and David's just sitting here thinking, I'm unworthy. Who am I that I should receive these blessings from God Almighty? And that's a proper response. Because who is David? Well, I'll tell you who David is. David's a sinful man who's going to do a lot of really dumb things. And he's going to make a lot of really bad decisions. Some decisions that are going to define his life that we talk about 2,000 years later. And yet God said, in spite of all of those things, I'm going to bless you because you are choosing to live your life for me. It's just stunning. It's just stunning. And sure enough, God blesses David. And the people get behind David. And finally, there's some peace in the land of Israel. Now, this covenant's been made with David and God. And you can see as the people see that, wow, our king is now right with God. And our king has a relationship with God that's real and tangible and, and it's noticeable. We really want to get behind him because he's clearly following God. Not only that, but in the next couple chapters, we see that David is conquering his enemies, enemy after enemy after enemy, just annihilating them. And his kingdom is getting stronger and stronger and stronger. Daily, 
battle after battle. They get stronger, they get mightier. So God's blessing is on David. And all of these good things are happening in the life of David. All of these good things are happening in the kingdom. All of these good things that that you look at and you go, wow, look how God's blessing that family. Look how God's blessing that king. This is just an absolutely amazing thing. And while we would look at David and we would go, wow, success, success, success. This is great. This is great. This is great. Let's lift him up. Let's lift him up. Let's lift him up. And the children of Israel would be thinking the same thing. And they're thinking, wow, our nation's finally on the right track. And what a, what a blessing it would be to know that the nation that you're a part of actually is doing what God wants them to do. I mean, imagine that today. It would be great to be able to hold your head high and say, this is a a Christian nation. This is a nation that, that God wants to bless. It would be amazing. And that's what they get to experience, almost all of them. But there's this crippled guy. He's not so happy because there's a problem. There's finally peace in the land. And now David's going to start to do what David needs to do. The enemies are taken care of. There's no real problems. So what's next on the agenda? Well, it's probably about time to go ahead and finish off Saul's line so that nothing pops up. That's the next logical step. Now that your kingdom is established and now that your kingdom is in place and now that things are going well, now that you don't have enemies to fight and, and to conquer or to protect against, well, now you've got to make sure that problems don't arise. So now we're going to go through and find people out of the house of Saul and we're going to make sure that they don't become a problem. That's what he's thinking. This little boy who got dropped at five years old's name is Mephibosheth. Jonathan's son, the next rightful king, according to the people. And he's worried because David's got God. That's not good for me. David's got peace. Well, that's really not good for me. Now David's going to start looking. And I I can say all day, I promise I won't try to rise up and I promise I won't rebel. But we all know what's going to happen as soon as he finds out I'm alive. It's over. It's over. And so he's hiding. He can't provide for his family. He's a cripple. He can't run. He physically can't run. He's got nowhere to go and nothing to do. And while all of the children of Israel are going, wow, this is great. And with every battle that's won and every, and every growth of the kingdom and every, every day that David becomes more and more powerful, while the people are excited and while the people see this as a good thing, there's a line of Saul that says, oh boy, this is really not good. This is really getting worse and worse day by day by day by day. And sure enough, a knock comes on the door of Mephibosheth one day. And somebody comes before him and says, hey, I hate to tell you this, but David found you. You got to go see him. Can you imagine the thoughts that are running through his mind? It's over. It was a good run. I mean, I, I, I made it so far, but this is it. And they load him up and they bring him to the palace and they bring him before David as David's sitting on his throne. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 5. And David, the king David sent and fetched him out of the house of Mekar, the son of Emuel of Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come to David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said unto Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold thy servant. Here we have a crippled man who by every account should be dead. Does not deserve to be alive. His family was overthrown. He should not be there anymore. He has no right to the throne. He has no right to life. 
and yet he's been hiding, trying to stay alive, and the clock has finally struck noon, and it's time to stand before the king. He falls on his face in reverence, and he says, Behold thy servant. And David says to him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness. Why? For Jonathan, thy father's sake. You know what David said right there? A long time ago, I made a promise. I made a covenant with your dad. And I told him that I would take care of his people if he took care of mine. And your dad would have kept his word, and I'm going to keep mine. And it only gets gooder from there. (laughs) And he said, I will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father. Thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. Not only that, skip down to verse 9. And the king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertaineth to Saul and his house, Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him. He can't do it himself. So you're going to till the land for him and shall bring the fruits that thy master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread always at my table. Now Zibia had 15 sons and 20 servants. And Zibia said unto the king, according to all My Lord, the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah, and all that dwelt in the house of Zibiah were servants unto Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, and he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both his feet. Here's what happened. David said this, I made a promise a long time ago and I'm going to keep that promise. And I'm going to let you live in my palace and I'm going to let you eat at my table. And not only that, but your servants, I'm going to let them have all of the land and I'm going to let them work on that land and I'm going to let their families live and they get to have it all. But you don't have to worry about any of it because you're staying at my house and you're eating off my table. And what's his response? Verse 8. And he, bowed his, him, and he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant? Who am I? Who am I? What is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? Does that sound familiar? It's the same response David had when God made those promises to him. And so because God made a promise to David... And was good to David when David didn't deserve it. David kept his promise and he was good to somebody who didn't deserve it. Especially somebody who should have been killed off a long time ago. And now we have a king who is being beyond generous to somebody who doesn't deserve it. And that person who doesn't deserve it gets to sit at the king's table And his family's taken care of, and he gets to eat the same food that the king gets to eat. And I'm just telling you, that's an amazing story of a person who doesn't deserve anything, and yet there's a king who takes the time to take care of that person in spite of who that person is because he made a promise a long time ago. And I'm just telling you that our God has made promises to us, and he's given us these promises, and he's told us over and over that he'll supply our need. And that he'll give us peace when we need that peace. And that he will make us to be called the sons of God. And we get to be God's children. And we get to be called his sons and daughters. And we get to sit at his table. And when he looks at us, he doesn't see us for who we are. He doesn't see us for people who deserve to die. But he sees us for people who have been accepted and covered by the blood of Jesus, his son. And now we get to be the sons and daughters of the king of kings. And if you thought it was good for Mephibosheth to sit at the king David's table, I'm just telling you, it doesn't even get close close to how we get to sit at the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords table. And he takes care of us. 
And it might just be that we take a little bit of time tonight and we just say, God, I don't deserve how good you've been to me. And this world is crazy. And while things are going on around me, it might be that I get scared or that I get frustrated or that I get annoyed at different things that are happening. But I'm just going to take some time and I'm going to thank you because you have accepted me even though I don't deserve it. And I get to sit at your table and you're going to take care of me and you're going to take care of my family. And when I'm worried, you're going to give me that peace that passes all understanding. And when I have a need, you're going to provide that need and you're going to give me everything that I need right when I need it in spite of who I am. And we get to sit here and say, I'm just Mephibosheth. I'm just a broken person who doesn't deserve anything. And yet here we have the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords saying, you're mine. You get to sit at my table. And it's just probably a good reminder that we have tonight that we ought to just thank him for being good to us because he is good to us. And there are hard times. It's not easy for Mephibosheth to be a broken man and not be able to provide for his family. There's probably some emotional things that are going on in his life that, that say, look, I can't even provide for my family. What am I supposed to do? What kind of man am I? It might be that he thought, well, David, his people killed my people, and that's my throne, and I deserve that. Can you imagine all the thoughts that have gone through his mind? He's literally a broken cripple because of the circumstances of the takeover. There's some serious things going on in the life of Mephibosheth and the thoughts of Mephibosheth, and yet here he finds himself living in the palace, eating from the king's table. What a, what a story. <laughs> What a story. And we ought not be too surprised because if we take a second and look at our own lives, we're the same exact way. Broken people who don't deserve the life that God's given us to live, and yet here we find ourselves sitting at the king's table called the sons of God. I'm thankful that God keeps his promises. I'm thankful that David kept his promise. And I'm thankful that we get to sit here today, this evening, and say, God, thank you. Thank you for being good. Even though I don't deserve it, thank you for providing for me. Let's just take some time this evening and thank God for who he is. We don't deserve it. We don't deserve it. But he's faithful. Lord, thank you for your word this evening. Thank you for this wonderful picture from David.